Well, thank you and good morning and welcome to VCF Midwest 13, no, yes, 13. Okay, um, this talk is, uh, well, it's going to be about Joseph Weisbecker and how he came about to make the uh, Fred computer, the, uh, that's his like early prototype um, uh, conceptually to become the 1802 microprocessor. And it's also going to cover uh, a little bit of the, the hobbyist computers, the hobbyist electronic enthusiasts of the time. You know, we used to go to the magazines to uh, find all our ideas and build projects and, uh, and build these little gadgets out of wires and resistors and, 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 and make it do something awesome. Here's a picture of, well, basically a ordinary family, but of an extraordinary man, really. That's Joseph Weisbacher and his daughter, uh, Joyce and Jean. And uh, here's some of the things that he's done over the years, or we're talking, going back from 1951 to relay computers, uh, 57, the RCA 501, it's a transistorized computer. Uh, in 64, you can see uh, he did this Thinkadot uh, game, which was kind of a game where you drop these marbles and it flipped these logic, uh, uh, these little logic cylinders, and it kind of uh, you know made you think of and and or, and it, so it was a game. Um, and there's a lot more here to read, but yeah, uh, you, needless to say, you can see the guy has stretched his uh, skills from hardware, uh, software, games. He did uh, LSI studying, okay. Pipeline architecture, I'm, I'm thinking, wait a minute, pipeline, isn't that something that just came out you know, recently? No, no, it's, they thought of it like back then. They thought, well, we can make things more efficient and, you know, and uh, computers and electronics is all about you know, solving the puzzle. Um, well, it comes all the way down to the Cosmic 1802, and did he do more after that? Well, yeah, he even wrote a book, uh, you know, How Computers Can Make You Rich, and you know, I, I don't know, it hasn't worked for me, but <laughs> we're still trying. Um, here's the RCA 501, and there's like the transistorized computer, and you know, you can just imagine lights and switches, and I'm not sure if it's a stored program computer, or if it's just, you know, solving some equations, maybe it's glorified calculator, we'll figure it out. The, uh, this is the Thinkadot game where you would drop your marbles down here, these little holes over here, and these little uh, lights over here, these uh, were actually the disks in behind, and they would flip back and forth between colors, and your idea, to reset the unit, you would just flip it on its side, and everything, the, the disk would all fall on, on, on a certain way, and, and that was the default. That's the reset pattern, which is like dot, dot, and then the other four dots around. And you had to uh, go from there and drop the least number of marbles to turn them all on or turn them all off or to get the top row or, you know, there was a various uh, s schemes. And, but here we go, in, in 1965, he said computer is a, another something computer for fun. So he thought computers have to be fun and, you know, made a good choice. Um, the hobbyists back then, how did they build their electronics? Well, Heathkit was a big thing there, and that's what Heathkit sold. They sold uh, magazines, uh, well, sorry, catalogs that you can buy these kits, and, and you'd buy that case with, you know, with all the little parts, and you get it, and you get the instructions, and you start twisting resistors together and soldering, and, and sure enough, uh, after the smoke clears, you'd <laughs> get replacement parts, and, and, um, and, and bingo, people love building their Heathkits, and, uh, in like 1968, you know, Joseph Weisbecker thought, I'd love to build a computer. I'd love to buy a kit of a computer. And he's looking through the Heathkit catalog and he sees TVs and, you know, turntables and some test equipment, but no computer. He wants to buy, you know, and, and he thinks that this should be. And, and of course it happens. You know, the computer, Heathkit eventually sells a computer in 1978, 10 years later. Okay, and that's the, uh, the H8 computer, and here's this guy, he's all happy because well, he hasn't seen the smoke yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what does he do in 1968? Well, not many choices, and Radio Shack was 
there we go and let's go on down to Radio Shack and get some parts and and that was I, I found that in one of the you know in the researching and I'm thinking well great what does he get from Radio Shack and I go looking online and there's the Radio Shack catalogs and you know they're looking good there are lots of you know interesting appliances to buy and of course you know you go to the back and there's where all the parts are uh, first thing I see for parts are tubes Okay, and like there's lots and lots and lots of tubes, so obviously that's not going to help them any, but good thing to know they're all lifetime guaranteed tubes. <laughs> so, <laughs> hmm. okay, so I find some other pages that look a little bit more, of, uh, more relative to uh, what he's done with the Fred unit, and, and, and sure enough, he's obviously going to get some switches there and maybe a transformer, maybe an odd transistor here and there, but in terms of the IC chips, uh, not a lot of options there. Uh, there are these little flat packs, and so obviously he must have been getting them from somewhere else. So, well, we don't have too much information on that, but you know, it's uh, this is eventually with wherever he got, wherever he scrounged up the parts, uh, he made up Fred, and Fred is the basically the conceptual program uh, system of the uh, the cosmic elf. It was what he. It was basically a. A discrete component computer, you know, built up of you know 4,000 series chips, and to build, uh, to to make that, to basically prove out the instruction set, to prove out its functionality, to to make a make a sense of it, to make, you know, uh, all right, yeah, proof of concept, okay, and he. Went all out with it. Of course, he made a you know a manual, and uh, he wanted it to be fun. He put a happy face on there, and it, Fred is for all ages. You know, can computers be fun? Here we go. So there's a repeat of his, uh, you know, that that theme that he's got. Computers have to be fun. Okay. Here's a picture of. Um, Afterwards, the Fred became uh, more of this is like the, the, this, uh, one, of, one of their earlier prototypes of the Fred, um, and this is a card reader where they would drop pictures, uh, drop cards to load the memory with uh, just basically like an optical reader, where, and you just drop the card. There was no motorized thing; it was just gravity fed. And, and these are his daughters, uh, Jean and Joyce. And Joyce later on became quite, uh, how can I say, uh, astute and quite you know professional. Um, interested in the computer she would do a lot of you know programming and she she saw it as a puzzle and she really you know delved into it and and, and solved it and she understood it and she later on became um uh, she did a lot of programming for some of the early cosmic and the studio programming and uh and, and you could say she's also she was also one of the first independent programmers she did the um you know she wasn't even like hired by the, by RCA later on she like was uh independently contracted anyway she did a lot of you know i guess that's just proof the apple doesn't far you know fall far from the tree um there we go there's fred a nice close up picture this is a picture i took of uh of the actual unit i got to see it i was very lucky uh, i saw this it's it's on exhibit at the uh, at the Starnoff um collection in new jersey and this was actually here done at the um vintage computer fest in uh, in uh east in new jersey and uh there was all kinds of neat things over here and i saw and i learned more things about joseph weisbecker i saw he had like all these different uh, games and other things, and uh, they were really impressive. Uh, I, I wish I could have taken, you know, better pictures and, you know, presented that. But really, I want to focus my uh, my presentation on the 1802 itself. So let's see. There's he developed the cosmic 1802, and he started putting them into various prototypes. And these are all again uh, from the v VCF East show. Um, there's one over here. He's even he's even included a little cassette tape. That's a cassette, uh, like a little so, like a little Walkman of the type at the time. Okay, so you could uh, load your programs, you know, just play, hit play, and you know. So he's got a built-in, you know, multi uh, mass media, you know, to load and save your stuff. Okay, um, Fred. Here we go. Fred is an experimental model of a new computer for use in schools and homes. This type of computer should cost no more than a hi-fi system or a, a set of encyclopedia. You know, a hi-fi system, there you go. That's the Heath kit and the Radio Shack all full of hi-fi systems back then. And a set of encyclopedia, encyclopedia, where are those? I, I remember those, okay. We don't, that's, um, 
in the internet, doesn't that, didn't that replace the encyclopedia? Anyway, but what I love is this last line here. By 1976, the cost of the circuit should be less than $80. Okay, what a prediction. Okay, here he spent $400 worth to make Fred, and, and it's going to drop to less than 80 bucks in, like, uh, in four years. Really? Okay. Um, I certainly couldn't make that prediction, you know, but he did, and, and guess what? He was right. Um, okay, uh, these are a couple of his other projects as well. That Think a Dot game, he later on um, published it in Popular Electronics. This is uh, right out of Popular Electronics, uh, 1974. And again, he said, do, do you dare challenge a, band, a handful of CMOS chips to a game of logic? And I'm just looking, where does he say fun? It's gotta be, say, it's gonna be fun there somewhere. All right, and this other one really blows me away because this is a discrete logic space war game that he built, he designed, these are all 4,000 series chips. They're just AND gates, logic gates, counters. These are a couple of 555 timers. Okay, you've got these uh, little potentiometer and you move these, these dots back and forth. These are your spaceships and you, and you shoot lasers at each other. You try to take each other out. Very simple little video, video game um, from 10 chips. Seriously, this has got to cost like, I don't know, maybe 20 bucks at a time, if that. So. You know, again, it was a popular electronics. It was April 1976. He brought this out. You know, but really, I want to talk about the 1802, and uh, it obviously comes in different packages and this and that. Here's a little sample of a, a chip from 1976, and this one it says 0724. I don't know. That must be 80 something. All right. Where was the 1802 actually used? Well. Up here, we got the educational hobby market in the, in the ELF and the, the RCA VIP. Commercial market, there was a bunch of computers made from it. None of them really got very far. And then there was also the uh, commercial different systems, like shovel arm systems used them some of their things, traffic controllers, barcode readers, a car ignition system, factory automation parts. Okay, games, well, Studio 2, RCA VIP. Uh, Something I recently found was he also did a, a number of stand-up uh, video arcade games, and that should be on that list. And then aerospace military, well, we know the, the, the space at Galileo, Hubble telescope, uh, the Venus probe, and some other military stuff. I just put down classify. I don't know. I, I, that's above my pay grade. I don't know. All right. 1802 was built and conceived back in 75. Can you get an 1802? Here's the funny part. Is, you can still buy an 18, they still can make you an 1802. Here's a data chip from Intercell uh, from October 2008. You know, I guess it hasn't really changed very much, but yeah, yeah, this chip is probably the only chip that was, you know, conceived of in 1975, and you can still buy it today. You can still order them. Um, probably costs you a little bit, but you can still order them. Uh, RCA, I guess they, they don't make, RCA doesn't make them. It's either Intercell or at some point Harris was making them as well. And uh, I don't know if they sold it off or they gave, I don't know what happened there, but that's, they've shaded off. Anyway, um, going back to the hobbyist market, what were the computers you could build back then? Well, July 74, the Mark 8. January 75, the Altair. Okay, um, well, uh, what else was there? So here we go. The, uh, the Mark 8 was built with, a, with the fourth, uh, 8008 from 72. It took a couple of years to get into a magazine, and Ed Roberts took a year to get the 8080 into, uh, you know, into that. But uh, Joseph just right away took the RCA 1802, and that same year he, he knew that by getting it out to the hobbyist market, there will be uh, you know, it's just another market out there to get interest into this processor and, and get it out to the people who can use it and make, up, make something of it. And just for uh, reference, there's the other chips that came out in that year, 6800, 6502. I think some of you have heard of that one. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so there, there it is on the on that magazine cover and a close up of it. And like I say, simple little thing. There's your 1802, some RAM, uh, some logic to hold it all together, some, and then basically your switches to enter your commands. Uh, a couple of switches over here to control the mode it's in, whether you're running or loading. Uh, MP for memory protect, so you can verify it's all, you know, entered correctly before it crashes. <laughs> all right, um, 
And this is the actual uh, article itself. And I've got a copy of the article here if anybody wants uh, uh, to take a look at it and read it. And it's, it's, I've got handouts for everybody if, uh, if they're interested in that. So um, here we go. Oh, I, I should go back here. I want to just say something. You know, remember he said in 76 it's going to cost 80 bucks? Well, here he says it again. It, this is in 76. It, he was right. He got it. You know, good for him. All right, so here we go. Build the Cosmic Alpha. This is right out of the article itself. And um, I highlighted a few interesting things. You know, it's cheap. All right, so instead of paying 60 bucks for an 8080 processor, I, you know, as, as, as a poor teenager, I'm, I'm going with this. Okay, 65K. Actually, actually, this is funny. Okay, there's there's 64K, but he, why does he call it 65K? You know, I guess the the the, the 1024 uh, bytes per K wasn't really uh, you know uh, a, you know uh, a status quo thing back then. All right. So okay, it's got I/O. It's got you know, of course it's got I/O. Uh, it's got an interrupt. It's got on-chip DMA. So this processor isn't just a processor. It's a microcontroller. Okay, you got input pins and you got output pins and you got a DMA controller built into it. Later versions of the 1802 even included like a timer and stuff. So it was uh, meant to like, you know, do more than it can as, a, as just a microprocessor. Okay, it used a 16 by 16 matrix of registers. That was huge back then. You know, most processors back then just had, you know, your, your program counter and accumulator uh, and maybe something to add to the accumulator. <laughs> I don't know. All right, um, because it was CMOS, it ran between three and 12 volts. Wow, that's a, there, there's, you got choices there. You can run it on batteries, you don't need a regulator, you can, you know, you don't, they can run it on your car battery. Okay, very low current drain, yes. Uh, well, the 8080 drew like maybe 100 milliamps. This thing was like under about 50 microamps. It was, this thing could run on batteries and it would run on batteries for a long time. So. In 1975, this thing was really, you know, in the right direction. Okay, of course, it, you know, he didn't lose touch with reality, TTL compatibility, and uh, built-in clock, right. Because the 8080 wasn't good without the clock. You needed, a, you needed a separate clock chip to run the 8080. And some of the other processors, same thing. You needed these, more, you know, um, uh, dual-phase clocks to get to move the data around. Well, no, not this chip. You just put one crystal and it's got its own oscillator. It took care of the rest for you. You know, very simple, simple. Okay, um, and like I say, with that on built, uh, that, that built in DMA, it lets you load a sequence of bytes without having to toggle address. And here's the, here's the kicker right here, no ROM, no ROM. What does that mean? You know, to a 13 year old teenager um, looking to build a computer, I'm thinking, where am I going to get a ROM and how am I going to program that ROM? I don't have a programmer. Um, I phoned around a few places and I asked, you know, how can I program this ROM and, you know, how much is a ROM? And, well, first of all, they're expensive. And secondly, uh, how am I going to program? Well, the, the guy's saying, well, you send me a hex file. What's a hex file? What's a file? Okay. I, I'm going to give you a table of, of, you know, of handwritten codes and, 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 you, can, and you can program them for them. Oh, well, and they, they said, well, to hand write, to hand input all that, it's going to be like about $400. I'm like, uh, no, that's not happening here. So when I looked to build something, it said no ROM. I'm thinking, that's great. That's, I can do this. Okay, here's an inside look of the 1802. Where's the program counter? <laughs> that is the first thing that people will say, where's the program counter? Okay, well, there isn't one. Well, there is actually 16 of them, but there's not one. Well, anyway. P actually points to the program, is a four bit register that points to one of the 16 bit registers, and that's your program counter. Okay, so general purpose, it's like all fully symmetrical. The program counter can just be automatically changed from one register, that, and so it's register zero to register F. So it's all hexadecimal. He, you know, he saw the, the usefulness of hexadecimal, and you know, forget this octal, and octal is kind of funny, weird, you know, because there's different ways of you know, doing octal, and there's always, there's always that last digit in octal that's, you know, that only, that never goes to seven, it's always a three, or, you know, and then if you merge it with another octal, well then, yeah, it's, it's messed up. So hexadecimal is nice and neat and just keeps things, you know, uh, in line with the eight-bit bytes. 
okay, so these registers, uh, no, so the pro being a, a, anyone could be a ver uh, program counter uh, lets you change from one register to the next. And the moment you change to another uh, program counter, the next instruction came from that program counter, not affecting the previous one. So that was a great way to have a single instruction automatically uh, branch you off somewhere else as a subroutine, and then you just change back to the previous program counter, and you just, and there you go. There's your there's your return. So a single byte to call, a single byte to return. You know, no loading, no multiple cycles for that. Uh, of course, you probably needed to set that all up earlier and have that ready to go. Um, well, what else do we have in here? We have the D. Well. D is your data register. Okay, that's really what we call the accumulator today, but that's what they call it back then. And then there's your arithmetic logic unit and just one flag, which is your data flag. And that's every time it either shifted out or did a carry out or a borrow. All right. The rest of this is the, the rest of the, the cosmic elf. Okay, so that's inside the 1802. The cosmic elf has uh, 256 bytes of RAM, not K, just bytes. Um, <laughs> Some input switches, some output, the output display, your, uh, and then your control, and again, your clock crystal, just that one. Now, here we go with the registers for the actual 1802 itself. The, he just, he breaks it off and he says, well, they're 16-bit, but you know what? We have to address them as a high and a low. So they're high 8 bits, your low 8 bits. The chip itself, this is all in the article that shows you, uh, you know, a pinout and there's your power, your ground, no plus 12, no minus 5, no, you know, filament voltage. <laughs> okay. So here's your IO flags built in. This is like IO pins, right, built in. There's your Q out. That's an IO pin. So instead of being GPIO where you can program it as in and out, no, it, it wasn't that advanced. Uh, you know, it probably would have been, if they would have continued, he probably would have come up with that next. It was, you know, but he, that wasn't there. It was just a dedicated input and a dedicated output. Um, and then your bus, your data bus, and your memory address over here. And you're looking, where's the high address? Well, it's actually multiplexed with your low address. Okay. And... Uh, the rest is just some read and write signals and, oh, and your DMA and your interrupt controls, you know, it's, it's good, everything's there. So there's a timing signal for it. The, uh, again, the simplified timing signal, just something to not throw you for a loop, just to give you your essentials in the, in the article. If you go into the data sheet, there's like far more detail than this, but just to let you know, hey, yeah, your clock is happening, you know, your TPA is gonna, you know, do your high byte and low byte, but here you go, a memory read cycle is just gonna be, you know, that whole distance and, the, and a memory write. Now, these obviously don't happen at the same cycle. There's gonna be one or the other, not both. Um, but he just shows it just to be simplified and give you a, a conceptual idea of, of how the data is moving around in the computer. The whole schematic for the Alpha, well, there aren't many chips, so the whole schematic isn't very big either. It just sits on two pages, the, the main the meat and potatoes and basically the control section and, and uh, your input switch. And your input switch there just toggles that DMA in to get your data loaded in there. And, um, well, you got your processor. There's your crystal just connected right to your processor. And uh, your input switches to the bus, your RAM to the bus, your uh, output display to the bus. That's it. Uh, if you wanted to, you could build that circuit in, you know, an evening or two. He gave a small. Uh, most of the instructions are here. Uh, there's a few that are not. There are not, but the, there aren't as significant as these. These are the majority of the instructions, and and they're just you know the the, the loading of those registers, the event, you know, incrementing and decrementing those registers, uh, and then there's all the arithmetic functions and. Um, now here's the funny thing with, uh, with anybody who's ever built an ELF. Uh, we had to load those things all with the switches and, and even though all these uh, instructions had mnemonics and whatnot, we never bothered with mnemonics because they're useless to us. We needed to know the code. You know, we wanted to load the accumulator. Well, that wasn't LDI, that was F8. Okay, and that's how we would write our code. We would just handwrite, you know, all these F8, zero, zero, you know, uh, f, you know, uh, or maybe, we'll do, or maybe we got smart and we'd, we knew the, re, uh, the program counter had a zero in the upper byte right off the bat. So we would just load the upper byte. So we would do a nine zero. And that, that nine zero, where's that nine zero? It's over here somewhere, uh, nine. There you go, the upper byte to D. So we would 
that would be a, a, a nice way to just clear your accumulator just with one byte, not, you know, instead of doing F800, we could just do a 90, and that, that saves a byte. That's important when you only got 256. So we save the byte with that, and um, yeah. Uh, so we knew all these codes, and anybody you talk to that's ever built one of these, they'll probably have at least half of that still memorized today. Uh, he, in, in, in the article, he shows you a simple program that will simply run the cue light every time you push the button. So here we go. It's basically step one, turn off the cue light with the 7A. Step two, uh, check the input button if it's pressed. If it's not pressed, just sit in that loop forever. Stay off. If it is pressed, go on to next step three, turn on the light. And let's go back to the loop this way. Okay, a very simple flow chart, four steps. Uh, what is that? Uh, six bytes. I loaded this in when I first built my ELF. I remember I was like 13 years old. I still remember that. I still remember loading that instructions and uh, doing, first doing all the preliminary tests, checking the voltages, checking all this, making sure I'm not going to blow a chip or something. And then I, I loaded this in there and I turned on run and I'm ready to push the in button. And, and sure enough, I push the in button and the cue light comes on. Now, I've wired lights to switches before, and that's been great. But now here's a software-controlled light, and that, like I say, that just blew me away yeah, at 14 year old. It just blew me away to, 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 you know, anybody else saying, oh yeah, big deal, a switch to a light. Oh, no, but no, it is a big deal. <laughs> All right. Here's some of the builds uh, of the ELF. This is actually my build. This is a rebuild of, uh, of my ELF using the original chips um, on some... Uh, I, I rebuilt this, by the way, for VCF uh, Midwest in 2014. Uh, I was doing the RCA exhibit, and I had a bunch of RCA computers, but I thought to myself, wait a minute, I haven't got you know, an ELF that looks like the ELF. And so I quickly put this together as fast as I could, or well, was as, as soon as I could get all the parts together. And, and I tried to get as, as accurate as possible to the article, and even to, down to the screws to get the little hex screws in there. Um, I was lucky to find these switches and some old surplus equipment from 1969. So you know, everything is pretty much age uh, accurate on this, on this you know, just it was just assembled in you know, 2014. Uh, and it was actually assembled wire wrap, which I, you know, which is how the original would be wired, you know, and, uh, you know, switches just soldered and there we go. You know, you can build it with wire wrap and most people did that back then, uh, except me. I, I didn't have, I couldn't afford wire wrap. That was just extra cost for wire, extra cost for the tool and, and the sockets were expensive. So. Back then, I actually built my stuff, and I still do. I build it point to point. And this is where you just put normal sockets and you just solder those sockets, whatever wire you have handy. And I remember my first elf, I actually used telephone wire, 22 gauge wire. I would sit there meticulously bending and twisting and curving and, and getting it. And that was okay for the elf. But when I got to the build my, uh, my, my 4K board, I, by the time I laid down all the data bus across all the 4K chips, I had a bundle of, uh, of wire about a centimeter thick, okay? And it was like, I'm thinking, oh, I better not have a short in there. <laughs> I'll never get it out. <laughs> anyway, um, of course, a lot of people built their elves. There's, there's mine over there. And here's a bunch of other elves all built after the original, you know, as, as, as accurate to the original as possible. Everyone's done their, their job. Um, this one is built with, the, uh, with Article 4 built in, which, which adds, adds the uh, Pixie video chip in there. Here's the Pixie video chip again. Um, these other ones are not. They're just uh, the, like, like the basic. And uh, there we go. There's another one with the basic. And so uh, this one's a really nice model. Uh, it, that look, looks really good. Um, of course, some people couldn't get these, uh, uh, these chips from HP, so they got these other ones from TIL, and they're st uh, they look the same. Of course, not everybody built the ELF like the original. They started, you know, I, you know it's a schematic. I can sort of build it the way I wanted to and, and get the extra functionality. So this guy's built an ELF using, like, switches and and actually my my elf kind of my elf my original elf kind of looked like this except instead of having the display it had the leds over here okay because those like those displays again were uh, too expensive for a teenager at the time so 
you know, here we go. Here's one, like I say, he's, I don't know, he's got uh, seven segment displays and he's probably got the, uh, those, those, those drivers that do hex to seven segment. And so he's expanded his, you know, uh, width wise. This guy's expanded his length wise. He's sort of built the original elf there. You can see it, but then he's added some, you know, some room for a function, you know, for expandability. Um, and here's some more where they've just sort of taken that same theme and they've just added more and done it their own way. And, and then they get a little bit more fancier here. You see they built a nice case and box around it. Here's got a, a real nice sloped front and, you know, built on these rails. And obviously this is all cut and it nice and neat. And, you know, there you can see uh, another one with the sloped front and, you know, uh, some craftsmanship, you know, nice plexiglass, some, uh, some, some wood and, you know, 45 degree cut there. And, um, you know, fancy, and then there's the ones that are not so fancy, you know. <laughs> They've done the uh, b breadboard, and okay, well, whatever, it's an elf, it works. It, it can be built anyway, it's all uh, low, slow logic, so it should be fine. Um, here's some of the newer replication, uh, newer renditions or, uh, of, the, of the elf. This is uh, the retro elf done by Dave Runco. Another one here, the, uh, the membership, elf membership card done by Lee Hart. These are all like recent things done in, you know, in this last, decade. Um, okay, then there's the anniversary elves. Spare Time Gizmo made this elf, this, uh, the 30th anniversary in, in 2006. And in 2016, a couple of years ago, we did the 40th anniversary elf. Uh, and this was kind of just a, an all wire wrap function. So we ended up even getting switches that had um, the long uh, legs and we could just wire wrap to them. So there was absolutely zero soldering on this board. All the parts, even the, even the resistors and stuff, they just plugged into a socket, a wire wrap socket, and they were all wire wrapped. So um, yeah, that was just, you know, just an, uh, an exercise in doing wire wrap. Okay, then there's the, the other gun, the other uh, elves, people started putting them in boxes and, uh, you know, making them a little more fancier. Uh, getting, uh, you know, uh, making their own buses on them and doing what they want to do. You know, expanding them, more memory, adding sound, video, uh, whatever, you know, development systems they wanted to do with them. Here's another one where they've, you know, they've really decked this out. Look how many boards they've got in there. Uh, uh, there's always some memory boards, but what the others do, your guess is good as mine. Okay. Uh, Again, here's another elf from way back when. I, and I guess this person who built this elf thought, you know, three digits for the addressing was enough. Uh, you know, that's as much about RAM as they're all going to load in there. So, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, 4K, good enough. It's okay by me. All right, and that's, uh, and this, uh, this elf here actually belong, this belongs to, uh, to, to um, Nick Allen. You know, so you can see that they did a nice bust inside here. And he, I love the oval speakers. You, don't, you just don't see those anymore. Anyway, um, the only thing that doesn't really fit in here is this muffin fan. Like, it's all low power. It doesn't really create a lot of, anyway. All right, I guess they had a surplus and that's it. You know, there's, uh, there's me and, uh, and Nick and his elf and this is a uh, VCF uh, 10, I think. Yeah, something like that. And that's it. That's, speaking of VCF, uh, here we are. Okay. Thank you. Questions? Oh, questions. Yes. Oh, Josh Benson. But you, but you need to catch the, the guy who made the 1802's name, right? What's his name? Joseph Weisbecker. Yeah, that's, that's my name. You can forget my name. You just remember his. Yes, yes. So he actually worked with another engineer at, um, at RCA. He pitched the idea, he had to design the architecture, and when it came to implement it to, um, to LSI, he worked with another gentleman, Herzeg, I forget his first name, and uh, the, two, the two of them, when RCA accepted the, 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 the project, they, um, they, made the, uh, they actually laid out the, the, the die and went into production. Yes. Yes, and there was a there was a prototype for if you're talking about like a like a uh, like a development board, 
there was the micro tutor that was kind of made as a development board and that was that was there for that chip yes and yeah like I said I didn't want to take too much away from the, the that cycle but you're yeah, right I should have probably added that in, that in there yeah Probably not. I don't I think so. Yeah, you know what? Good point. And, and, and I've always thought of that. And that would have been probably the, the next, you know, could have been the next generation to make it like a, almost like the, like the spin processor out of, you know, the, what was it? Is it the spin? What's it called? The propeller. The propeller chip, yes. If they, that would have been a, you know, a really good, good move for it. And honestly, I think they're, he, the, the, a, big, a big problem was RCA did not uh, move forward with it. RCA at the time was just recently um, uh, switching its, uh, its CEO from, um, Dave Sarnoff was the CEO up until 1970, and then he handed it off to his son, and his son wasn't really that intuitive with electronics and computers, and he inherited the job and he didn't want it. Okay, but and so he kind of just uh, let these opportunities go by. He didn't recognize these opportunities, and one of the one of the biggest flops for what, what what sort of brought this down was there was the Studio Two, which was one of their early gaming con consoles, and it didn't quite make it to market first. It should have, but it didn't make it to market first because of red tape within RCA, and then and then trouble with FCC and their um, RF. Um, uh, mon uh, module, the, uh, the, the modulator. So because it didn't make it to market first, it, it lost that initiative and, uh, and it basically was, you know, looked at as a kind of a failure. Uh, meanwhile, Joseph Weisbecker did not see it as a failure. He's, he just said, that we're going to build the next version bigger and better color. We're going to do uh, joysticks. We're going to do, and he had the Studio 3 all ready to go. Okay, except that's it. RCA canned it. They just said, there's, there's no interest in this, and there's no money in this for us, and, you know, there's no money in video games, really? Okay, well, if that, yeah. so, yeah. But then did RCA must have kept selling that chip if it's in aerospace. What are, what are some of those decisions people made in Genetics 652 and FD80? Why, why didn't the chip itself live on? Okay, why did the chip live on? Good point. The reason is what the chip lived on in, in aerospace because the chip does use uh, hardened technology where it's silicon sapphire that makes it uh, radiation um, uh, impervious to radiation and that's why it was used in a lot of that technology and plus also the, because of its simple use and, and it was, it's really a, it's, today we know this chip as a risk processor, okay, back then, it, you know, before the concept of risk and KISC, this was a, this was a, a risk processor then, so um, and that made it I, I don't know how many transistors, I think it was like 5,000 transistors in, in that chip. So you can imagine 5,000 transistors uh, with lots of elbow room, nothing can go wrong. And that's what made them so reliable. And, and even that data sheet talks about a, a high reliability factor of the 1802. So that, uh, plus, you know, if the arrow, if, as soon as the military gets into something and they're doing, they're using that chip, well, that's all they want. The military is not going to accept, and they're not going to accept anything else. They're going to say, "I want that, and that's what you, you know, that's what we got spec, and you're going to provide that for us." And if, you know, and but when when it comes to military, it's all about, you know, yes, sir, right away, sir, you know, and and that's it. So. Yeah. Plus, also the CMOS and none of the other chips at the time were, which meant that your space probe could get by using a lot less current. Absolutely. And, and the dynamic clock speed, right? And the dynamic clock the speed. Down. Yes, yes, exactly. Right down to zero. Yes. Um, in the 1965, was he working at RCA? Yes. When did he, oh, so he was at RCA like early on. He was working there for yeah. Um, I believe he started around uh, actually about in the late 50s. I think he was already in RCA. Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.